Thank you everyone for that kind introduction. And uh, welcome everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you. I'll try to speak slowly for the sake of our translator. I get excited, as you will see, uh, but at the same time, I want to make sure that uh, I speak slowly enough for understanding. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have been to an Echo event before? Please raise your hand. All right. A good number of you. Uh, welcome to all of those of you who this is your first time, and welcome back to you who uh, have been to many Echo events before, and maybe one in the past. So, I'm going to try to keep track of my time to allow for some questions and answers at the end of it, but I do get excited, and uh, I'm just delighted to be here with you. I would be remiss if, if I didn't give a brief overview of what ECHO does, because really, it is our mission to equip and to empower you, those of you who are working with the poor and smallholders uh, around the world here in East Africa in this context. So um, I am I'm really happy to just give a brief overview. I promise I'll get to some agroecology here in in a little bit. But um, welcome on behalf of all of us, and thank you everyone and team for organizing this and doing such a wonderful job. So. Really, ECHO is a global organization. You're part of the East Africa, I have to say symposium, I was just in West Africa last week for their forum, so I apologize if I use the word forum or conference or workshop, but you're here in, in this context. But really, ECHO is a global organization, and um, we stand on the shoulders of, of giants that have gone before. Uh, many of you are, are those giants in this room. Uh, known some of you for a decade or longer, two decades, and uh, ECHO is now going into its 42nd year, so we're 42 years old. And one of the things that is wonderful about ECHO is that we have unity in our diversity. We have four offices around the world, um, this East Africa office, the West Africa office located in Burkina Faso, the ECHO Asia office located in Chiang Mai, Thailand, and then the ECHO Florida office in the United States. One of the things that is wonderful about having different offices is that each regional impact center takes on the cultural and ecological context. So those things that are unique to the region and those needs that are unique to the region, and that's absolutely essential for our understanding of sustainability, for understanding of agroecology here in a little bit, is that needs and context are essential. So having multiple offices allows us to uh, be relevant to the region. Um, the thing that unifies us, though, is our vision and mission. Next slide, please. So, oh, this format got off. That's okay. Our vision is to, oh, you can go ahead. All right, apologies for the format. Uh, our vision is to honor God by empowering the undernourished with sustainable hunger solutions. So sustainability is a big part of, of our DNA. Our target are the undernourished, and we're looking for solutions, innovations, options. And we'll talk about that a lot, because agriculture in particular, but also sustainable development, is based on the context, both the underlying ecological context of the soils and the climate and the rain shadow of where you are, your altitude, but also the cultural context, the language and the food and cultural values that people hold. The way that we do our vision is, our mission is that we follow Jesus by reducing hunger and improving lives worldwide through partnerships that equip people with agricultural resources and skills. So we I like to say we're not a development organization, so we're not actually doing development projects uh, like some of some of our colleagues and friends at some of the big development organizations or small development organizations. We're not a mission sending agency. We're an equipping, networking, and resourcing agency and organization. So it's our part to equip, to empower, and to network you with others so that together we can be successful. 
So how do we work? How do we actually um, work out our mission and vision? Our approach is through networking. We work through our network. And our network is diverse. Currently, we have over 18,000 global network members. And these, these include individuals. These also include organizations. They include representatives of organizations as well. So we have an incredibly large and diverse uh, network, which includes international and national non-governmental organizations. It includes communities and community leaders. It includes academics and researchers from uh, local universities and national universities, multilateral organizations like FAO. Uh, it includes, and increasingly we're seeing a lot of, of churches and, and local missionaries, so national churches, local churches, and their leaders. It includes in some regards government officials who are, are part of our network and also farmers and farmer group. And like Erwin said, we really, we really, one of our core values is that we believe everyone has something to bring, to share, both successes, maybe failures and struggles, um, and encouragement for one another. And uh, Erwin, I love what you said about networking and spending time getting to know each other. And the diversity is, is incredible. So I just want to encourage you to do that. How do we actually go about equipping a network? What are we looking for to equip? What's, what are these sustainable hunger solutions? Really, we're looking for practical and innovative options. Options. There's no silver bullet. That's a, uh, an English phrase. But what that basically means is there's not a one approach that's going to solve all the problems. There's not one approach that's going to solve all the problems. Because needs and problems and solutions are based on context. So what ECHO does is we are looking for practical and innovative options. And so one of the things I want to encourage you to do during this forum is to look for maybe two or three options that you think that might work in my context. So two or three, you're, you're going to be overwhelmed at times by the number of ideas and innovations and options that you are going to encounter. But really hone in on maybe two or three ones they think, yeah, that makes sense. That might make sense. I'm going to try that in my context to see if that works. So the way that we do that is that everything is under our umbrella of networking. So we are identifying or finding options. That's part of why these, these symposia are great, because we're sharing and learning new things together. We are, we are testing or validating options. Sometimes that's through our own research. Many times it's through your research to make sure that these options, they work, that they're valid. Um, we also then share. We spend a lot of time in the sharing of options. And I'll share how we do that next. And we need to do better at this, but really it's a key component in the process, is that we need to measure these options. And we have to rely on you a lot of times to let us know do these options actually work? Are they effective? Are people's lives improving? Are people's uh, sustainability improving? Is environmental and social and economic sustainability improving in that context? So this is really a cycle of how we work in options through networking. What are some of those options that we provide, that we share? that we encourage and inspire. We have 42 years of options, so uh, we work in quite a few different places over the years, but the ones in bold are what I would consider some of the areas in which ECHO has done the most work or has shared the most ideas and innovations about. So sustainable agriculture, really where agricultural is, is our foundation. But those of you who work in agriculture You've probably already seen that agriculture is tied to culture, and it's tied to community development, and it's tied to water and energy. And oftentimes these are competing things, and oftentimes we can optimize them, but as soon as you start working in agriculture, many times you start touching on these other issues as well. And so does that go. 
So besides sustainable agriculture, uh, this office has done a lot with appropriate technology. I love that there is a fair happening for you to see some options in action. We also have done a lot globally in seed saving and seed banking. A lot of the actual research we have done has been in seed banking based on the needs of partners and our own offices needing to learn how do we best save seeds in the tropics and subtropics. So, just to give you an idea of where we work, we have the four offices, and this shows our numbers from last year for training <coughs> events. So we have the four offices around the world, and um, we do quite a bit of direct training, as well as putting on more regional foreign symposia like this. One of the ways in which we one of the main ways in which we connect is electronically through echocommunity.org. When I say we have 18,000 members, uh, I'm referring to the number of active workers that have registered on Echo Community. If you haven't explored this, I encourage you to. It is a wealth, it's a treasure trove of information. Uh, we have drop down menus by language. And also by region, so you can go to the region and actually look for the resources most pertinent to this region of the world. Uh, just to give you a glimpse, this was last year's traffic through Echo Community. So we have about 196 countries every month that access Echo Community. Uh, you can see the breakdown, it's fairly, it's fairly uh, balanced across the different regions. And um, you can see in the, in the light brown, there's quite a bit of traffic from, from East Africa. One of the other great uh, wells of Echo Community is that you can actually connect. You can ask questions on Echo Community. And fellow network members have the opportunity to share resources, to encourage, to provide answers to your burning questions on Echo Community. And it translates into, I think we're up to 18 different languages in Echo Community. So if you're a Swahili speaker, you can use Echo Community and um, navigate in Swahili. How else do we work? We produce publications. These are all electronically available. Uh, they're open access, they're creative mm -hmm. commons. So you can use our resources, and as long as you attribute them, you can, you can use them, you can share them, you can change them. Uh, in your works, so I'd encourage you to do that. Echo Development Notes started, and these are our longest running publications. They come out every quarter. They work to 158 development notes now. We also create best practices notes. So for instance, if there's some topics that keep coming to the forefront over, over the last decade or several decades, we will combine those together and create a best practice note. So for instance, green manure and cover crops are one of those issues that have proven themselves over and over again. So we have compendiums of different notes on, on specific topics. We also offer research publications. As I mentioned, one of our core functions besides finding new ideas is also validate or test those new ideas. And sometimes we do that research ourselves. So we, we do peer-reviewed publications. The offices do as well, so does headquarters. And then we try to really translate that, that peer-reviewed research into more of an extension note. So we make it more available for uh, extension agents and community development agents and local leaders. And we, we translate those as well. We also have regional publications. So Echo Development Notes have been running for 158 um, editions now. But we also have local regional publications. So I was the director of the Echo Asia office for five years. And every quarter we put out an Echo Asia note. And so that note was a chance to, to showcase emerging options that were really working in the region. And I'm happy to, to share the most recent Echo East Africa note, which was just published last month in January. And we offer translations into many different languages, including Swahili. 
We also offer print publications, and there's some of those available. Um, I brought a box of them from the U.S. The top one, Agricultural Options for Small-Scale Farmers, is here. We also are, are looking really not to be redundant. We don't want to do work that others have already done. We want to, we want to honor the good work that has already happened. And so part of that is keeping our eyes open for publications, for um, notes and memos that have already proven their worth and to make those more widely available. So for instance, on the left is a cartoon about Thai natural farming. There was a university in Thailand that had done 20 years of research on natural farming and they published in Thai and we saw the value of that so we translated it into English and together with the university made those widely available. So um, yes, we do publish some of our own echo books, but we also co-publish publications with others. So we're always interested. If you have something that you think might be of value that you would like to explore co-publishing, please let me know. I'd love to explore that. But we also have global and regional seed banks. And this is one of the areas born out of need born out of the challenges facing communities and small-scale farmers all around the world, especially in tropical and subtropical climates, where we actually started a seed bank in Echo Asia in 2009, and we found out there was not a lot of peer-reviewed literature at all on seed saving in the tropics. What's the best way that communities and local NGOs can save their seeds in the tropics? Most of the work had been done in the temperate areas so that have been done in Europe and, and um, the United States. So we went about conducting research on community appropriate and NGO appropriate seed banking. And we have seed banks um, now in our centers. And really our seeds are open pollinated, locally adapted, and there's huge biodiversity and climate change implications for, for this. And we have quite a bit of information about local seed banking available on Echo Community. Next slide, please. Oh, we also have regional small farm resource centers, as well as a global farm. So in Echo, Florida, uh, we have a 57 acre farm. In the other three offices, we have small farm resource centers and seed banks, where we use those as demonstration areas, as training areas and as research and, um, and uh, validation areas. So you can get a glimpse of those. You can see the nursery. I had the privilege of visiting the Echo East Africa office yesterday and, and seeing that. We also offer different internships and volunteer opportunities. So if you're interested, talk to Erwin about volunteer and internship opportunities at this office. All the other offices have different degrees of formal programs as well. Next, please. One of the things that ECHO has done for 42 years of existence and um, continue up to this day is answering technical requests. So in the old days, when we were based just in ECHO, Florida, we would actually receive letters from people all around the world and our founder, first president, Dr. Martin Price, would hand type on a typewriter answers and options, send them in the mail to people all around the world. The internet has made that incredibly easier to do, and we still answer quite a huge number of technical requests. So if you have questions, or if you have a new innovation or idea or option you would like to share with us, please get in touch, because it is our delight to try to help you be more effective in your work. Please recognize Bob. Yes, and we're happy. Bob Hargrave in the back was on staff for 18 years at ECHO, and um, many of you probably interacted with Bob over the years. So um, it's great to have Bob here and to, to reconnect. We also offer global training and equipping events. COVID put a damper on many of those, but um, by the grace of God, we're up and running again doing events, and uh, not only in the form of symposia and fora, and global conferences, but also in more localized workshops and hands-on training events. Um, the top one is, is happening right now. Last week I was in Burkina Faso with our West Africa office, and they hosted a national forum for Burkina Faso. We had about 120
20 participants that were there. So you're joining part of, of the Echo Global uh, movement. Echo Asia has a conference coming up in October, and there's always different symposia happening throughout the year. So check out echocommunity.org. We try to keep it updated based on all of the trainings and equipping events happening around the world. All right, I think that's that for that one. Thank you for giving me a little bit of time to share about Echo, just so that, um, just so that you know. It's our delight that, that you're here, that you're joining us. Look forward to getting to know you and to hearing about your experiences. All right, let me shift gears a little bit and move into the topic of the morning, which is, is agroecology, sustainable food systems. And I have to say that most of this that I will share was born out of my experience of working with FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. In Rome, I was on the agroecology team. There in Rome, it's good to see some colleagues that I interacted with uh, while I was there. And I look forward to meeting you in this new capacity. If there is time later on in the next couple days, I I'm not going to get through all of this, but I want to share a story to help, to help solidify agroecology a little bit. But if there's time later on in the days, I would love to have a meet the speaker or a time to interact with you and any questions you have. Um, I've seen how agroecology is a really, really important and a really hot topic, so I love that. So speaking now will be more from my experience with, with FAO. So if I say we, it's probably referring to my time on the agroecology team, but I love to share because I've worked in agroecology uh, even for way before FAO. Okay, so let's look into a holistic approach for food production. So just as way of brief introduction, and other colleagues will share more about this this morning. What is agroecology? You hear it a lot. It's in the news. It's, it's, um, it's operated on by FAO and partners all around the world. But what is agroecology? When you look at agroecology, it is, okay, slide When you look at agroecology, it is complex. Uh, next one. All right, this is going to be rapid fire because it kind of goes. All right, so if you were to look online for a definition of agroecology, you'd be hard pressed to find one because it is complex. Not in the sense that it's difficult per se, but it's complex and that it's dealing with complex systems and multi-dimensionality. So it cuts across the different dimensions of sustainability environmental sustainability, social, economic sustainability. So if you were to look, you would find over 30 official definitions that have been recognized by governments, by the UN, by academia, by NGOs, working on the theory, working on the practice, working on the social movement of agriculture. If we were to boil it down, I love this definition um, that, that has been brought forth and agroecology applies ecological concepts and principles to optimize interactions between plants, animals, humans, and the environment while taking into consideration social aspects needed for a sustainable and fair food system. So there you see the complexity dimension, not in the difficulty, I mean, it is a messy and complex um, idea, but the complexity in that it's using ecology to help, and the concepts and the principles of ecology, which is a systems and a complex adaptive systems approach to optimize interactions, but also taking into account social aspects and human and social values and cultural values to create not only sustainable food systems, but also fair food systems. One of the things that has emerged about agroecology is that it's not necessarily technology intensive, but it's knowledge intensive. It builds upon uh, existing knowledge as well as emerging research and scientific knowledge. Next slide. What are some common points? In 2014, FAO launched their work into agroecology and they spent 
uh, the better part of four years hosting symposia all around the world to hear people and their perceptions and their experiences with agroecology. And some of the emerging points are here. One was diversification. So an emerging common point among uh, actors and practitioners in agriculture around the world was diversification. So there's the diversity not only of plants and animals, but also diversification of livelihoods options and products and markets. So diversity, which makes sense. Diversity is a key part of ecology. Ecology thrives on diversity. Um, another common point was that approaches are contextualized. And we talk about that a lot as ECHO because you have context of the underlying ecosystem as well as the underlying culture and values of the people that make up the food system. Another common point is attention to human and social values and rights. And this would be a, a major change from our industrialized food system that has been born out of, out of the West experience the last 150 years. Another common point is co-creation or co-innovation between farmers and researchers. So valuing everybody that is a part of that food system, co-creating ideas and options together. So bringing the scientific rigor and methodology to farmers' uh, knowledge and local and indigenous knowledge as well. Another common point is that, and this moves into the food systems approach, is that agriculture takes on a territorial approach. It takes on territory, and, and several colleagues will talk more about territory and have worked in territory, but it, it's not just the farm field. It's not just sustainable production, but it moves up the scale from the farm to the community, to the transportation and distribution network, to the consumers, and then also the waste recycling. So it gets into a territorial approach. Another common point is the need for responsible and equitable governance of natural resources. So ideas that agriculture touches upon include uh, food distribution and markets and land tenure and land access and access to capital and access to credit, subsidies or lack thereof or, or, or poorly working subsidies. And in whole, getting into complexity, it's really important to remember this, but agroecology moves beyond the production systems to the entirety of the food system. Next, please. I love that Wetzel et al. in 2009 uh, looked at agroecology, so I was at Wetzel's in France now, and what they saw when looking across the global work of agroecology, is they saw agroecology really takes on the flavor of the different areas in which it works, and they saw agroecology as a science, a practice, and a social movement. I'll say it again, a science, a practice, and a social movement. And uh, there's a great paper about it. But what, what you see is that depending on the context, you see different, different versions of this, and different versions of these three things interacting and working together. Next slide. Okay, so the burning question now, I'm sure there'll be more theory and background in agroecology, and I'd love to share more with you, but what does agroecology have to offer smallholders? And how can you apply agroecology to your work? Uh, really, agroecology offers an overarching umbrella. It offers an overarching umbrella. Without getting into all the nitty gritty, which, uh, especially as someone who is a sustainable agriculture and research, like we can go really deep and get into the details and get lost in the weeds sometimes about uh, the research and the, the sustainable agriculture methods. But really, agroecology offers an overarching umbrella. And what FAO saw was that many different options and approaches can exist as long as they are moving towards sustainable food systems. So many options can exist as long as they're moving towards sustainable food systems. So these include sustainability on the side of production practices. Different practices, you know, because it's based on context. It's based on the needs and the challenges and what works in your context. So foundations for farming or regenerative agriculture, which has been really emerging. These include integrated farming, animal integration, agroforestry, conservation agriculture. 
moving towards sustainable production. But agroecology, because it also is about the food system, needs to, to also touch on the environmental sustainability dimension. Things like looking at biodiversity and biodiversity conservation, looking at climate resilience, which includes adapting for climate change and mitigating climate change. It also touches on the economic dimension. So options like participatory guarantee systems or certifications, farmers markets, value addition, those are some options that can help move the food system towards more sustainability. And also because we have to touch on the fair and equitable food system approach for people, there's a social dimension involved. So farmers organizations, social movements, decent work, youth employment, women's empowerment. So uh, agroecology offers that overarching umbrella. It's also a pathway to achieving the sustainable development goals. So the 2030 agenda, we actually, Clara Nichols from Sokola in South America, helped to put together, she looked at agroecology and she mapped out the sustainable development goals that agroecology can help to achieve. And when you look at it, or when you can just rapid fire, there's more down the side. But many of the sustainable development goals, agroecology can help to move those goals along, to help countries and individuals and organizations meet those goals. If you're looking for other resources, FAO is a, a great host of resources on agroecology, but also I encourage you to check out the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food, or Fit Best Food. In 2020, they looked at agroecology for subsistence agriculture and agroecology for industrial agriculture. And what they found was that there's different starting points in those very different <coughs> systems, but there's some common and shared aspects that need to happen. One of the first ones for both systems is building and exchanging knowledge. So remember I said that agroecology is knowledge intensive. It combines farmers and producers' knowledge with scientific knowledge to create synergies. Um, but they also looked at diversification and the, the need in industrialized systems to, re, to relocalize because they've lost connection to the locale, to the territory. Where subsistence agriculture needs better connection to markets. And you've probably seen that yourselves in this region. Next slide. Um, next slide. This just shows the complexity of food systems. So, that's a scary slide, I admit. Complex adaptive systems are messy but beautiful. Um, but I want to share some practical tools for us, for you, to think about agroecology as a way to transform food systems and make development more systemic, more holistic. Next slide, please. I'm going to skip through a couple of these. But these are great. Steve Gleesman wrote a great textbook on it. Next slide. He's in levels. And, uh, I'm going to focus on FAO's 10 elements of agroecology and share a story to end about how I saw this framework for thinking about agroecology in practice. So the 10 elements of agroecology were developed by FAO with partners over the course of five years. Next slide, please. And the elements touch on the different dimensions of sustainability. And that's really important. Because food systems are complex, they interact, the 10 elements offer a framework for thinking about those complex interactions in an easy to understand way. So what we have are in the light blue circles, we have the elements of co-creation and sharing of knowledge. This idea that I talked about of local knowledge interacting with scientific knowledge. At the top, we have diversity. The element of diversity looks not only at diversifying the crops you're growing, the animals you're growing, but also diversity of market access, diversity of products, diversity of livelihood options as well. Oops, can you go back? I think it's on time. Um, we also have recycling. It's a key element of agroecological systems. Those systems recycle. Waste products become valuable inputs. In light green, we have efficiency, 
and resilience. These are what we call emerging properties. When a system has diversity, when it has synergies with co-creation and sharing of knowledge, the system becomes more efficient over time. It also becomes more resilient over time. At the bottom, we have the two context features, culture and food traditions. That gets into the local culture, the values, as well as the food and cuisine, which often influence the agriculture and vice versa. We also have human and social values, how, how different people are treated in the system. And on the side, we have what we call the enabling environment. What, what, what elements do we need in order to actually help a system become more sustainable? We need circular and solidarity economies. So circular economies are those that, that really look at the cradle to grave, that really look at the whole, uh, the whole life cycle of our, of our agriculture and the food and the waste that we produce as humans. And we also need responsible governance to help enable this to happen. All right, next slide. I'm going to share now. I can go to the next one. I'm going to share a story and focus on the elements and, saw, and show how I saw this happen in, in time. So this is from my time in Asia. This is from a town called Meita. And Meita is a story of agroecological transition and transformation. So to give you a background of Meita, Meita is about an hour outside of Chiang Mai. And it's, Arusha reminds me a bit of Chiang Mai in terms of you have these valleys and you have the hills. They're not volcanic, they're the Himalayas that are their mountains. So valleys and hills, and there's a farming community in one of these valleys called Meita. And Meita for thousands of years had practiced traditional agriculture. They had a traditional way of water management so that during the rainy season they would store water and in the dry season use it for irrigation of their, their paddies. This was a community property regime. It was managed by the community. What happened was that in the 50s and 60s uh, there was a massive industrialized farming change. That town was focused solely on industrialized baby corn production. So those little corns that, that you get, it was one of the world's biggest exporters of baby corn. What it came along with it was they used hybrid seed that was pesticide intensive. There was an export orientation. They started to experience, over the course of decades, different challenges. They had the volatilities of the market. There was massive rural migration because they increased their debt load in order to continue to buy the inputs that they needed. Their kids started going to the cities and all the, the problems associated when your children moved to the cities. And they also started experiencing ill health from overuse and improper use of chemical pesticides. Next slide. So they became desperate. That community did not know what to do. They had, they had lost their traditional ways of, of agriculture. They were in debt. They had poor health. And they saw their soils just completely decline to the point where they were unproductive and they needed more and more fertilizer to, to just even try to maintain the levels that they once had. So those were the negative factors that enabled change. Some of the positive ones was that two children did end up going to school in the city. That's going to be important. There was also a shift in consumer sentiment in the city happening over those decades from the 60s until the early 2000s. And there was this ethos of this promotion by the king of this idea of being self-sufficient in your agriculture. So what happened? Uh, next slide. So there was one family. They got to the point of desperation. And they said, we can't do this anymore. We don't know how we're going to pay our debts. So they pulled out of those contracts. They had massive debt. And they said, we need to go back and figure out to farm, because we can't even feed ourselves. So they started farming the way that they used to. They started, they went back to diversification. They went back to polycultures and low inputs. They didn't want to buy fertilizers and pesticides anymore. And they started to really think about how did our ancestors grow? And how can we build upon that? And so they connected diversity to co-creation and sharing of knowledge. They reached out to other farmers to remember, because they had lost knowledge in those four or five decades, of how and what were the cropping cycles and how did our ancestors grow food in the valley. Next slide. And what happened? Oh, next one. 
What happened was that, uh, the next one, there we go. Then what happened was that synergy started to develop as they diversified the production with co-creation of the of knowledge, they started to experience synergies. Next one, please. There was a self-sufficiency focus for that family at first. But what they started to notice was an increase in food security for their family. They could actually grow their own food again. They began to increase recycling and efficiency. Uh, next slide, we'll show that. So as these synergies happened, Instead of buying fertilizer, instead of buying pesticides, they started making it themselves. They reduced their off-farm input, so they stopped buying stuff. They started adding animals back into their system to help their efficiency in recycling. And animals are absolutely essential to help sustainability because they are natural nutrient recyclers. Our soil microbes are as well, but so are animals. And so they reintegrated animals. They focused on soil health through green manure cover cropping and conservation agriculture. <clears throat> they also focus on ecosystem health. They realized that their watershed had been destroyed by the, the farming that they had done. And so they started banding together other farmers and focusing on preserving the watershed. They also started saving their own seeds and doing integrated pest management, which helped to build their resilience. Next slide, please. They started to, they started selling, little by little, to the local market, which allowed them to pay off their debts. They built their soil organic matter. And as this family started to have a rejuvenation, other families started to take notice. They were the outcasts at first. They were, they were ridiculed. But other families started to join with them because of their desperation as well. Also, researchers and students started to take notice. They wanted to learn from this community. And so, kids started moving back to the farm. Not only did they increase their resilience as a community and as a family and for their, their farming systems, but that increased the co-creation and sharing of knowledge. As researchers came, they started to co-create together. And kids started coming back to the farm. And they started to diversify markets, which increased their, their productivity. Next slide, please, Erwin. Um, you can hit the next one as well. As they had a greater interaction with consumers, they reestablished their connections to their culture and food traditions. Because as they were in touch with consumers, consumers said, you know what? We are tired of buying pesticide-drenched produce. We like that your produce is bio, it's organic, it's sustainable. But we also miss our traditional vegetables. Can you grow those for us? And so they did. And what happened was that they also increased their human and social values. The women became empowered. The youth who had gone to the university saw, you know what? Maybe I can make a living being a farmer and being my own boss and managing. And maybe I can use the skills and marketing I learned at the university to help connect my dad to Facebook so he can increase his market base. Next slide, please. Next slide. And they became well known throughout the area. These farmers started to band together. Researchers started to come. Students from international uh, universities started to come and learn with them. They established their own seed bank. Echo Asia started to go and to interact and share and learn together. Next slide, please. Uh, next. And what was interesting about this case was that the government really wasn't involved until a critical mass started to form. And so responsible government sometimes can kickstart a movement, and that's absolutely important. Absolutely important. But also responsible government sometimes needs to come along and, and really, really synergize with what's already happening in order to help that scale out and scale up. And the government took notice, and government workers would come and learn about better irrigation. And they enabled the community, which had been under the forestry department, to actually go back to their common property regimes and say, your community has thousands of years of watershed management. We want you to be in charge of your own watershed, because you're doing a better job than we can do. What the government also did was help to give this community better market access. So that was one of the enabling environments of responsible governance. They saw that con con 
consumers in Chiang Mai, an hour away, wanted healthy food. Next slide, please. And so the government helped establish more formal markets. They had already established their own community-supported agriculture, but the government actually provided a market for these communities and other communities who had, who had followed suit to actually be reconnected with consumers and producers in Chiang Mai. Next slide. And so the circular and solidarity economy helped to further increase the resilience, to help to further increase the synergies in that community. Next. And uh, this is some of the formal market that they have now in Chiang Mai. So livelihoods increased tremendously. The sustainability of the economics increased tremendously. Their environmental sustainability increased tremendously as well. The amazing thing was that, and I think this is one of the things I want to encourage you, is that sometimes the biggest changes unfortunately come out of a time of crisis. Sometimes the biggest changes unfortunately come out of a time of desperation. Whether that's here in East Africa, I've seen it in the United States over and over again, farmers and their transition to organic agriculture often born out of poor health, unsustainable financial debt, etc. But this is a beautiful and amazing thing that, that happened. And those elements are a way to think about that community and the transition they experienced. Next slide, it's my, uh, my last one. Oops, if you could go back. This is an oversimplification. It's an oversimplification. The only thing linear about this transition was time. That was the only linear thing, is that time marched onward. But otherwise, this was a complex system. So all these things were happening, some slowly, some more quickly than others. And so I think the Talmuds give us a wonderful framework in which to think about the different aspects of our systems, either a farm system, a community system, a market system, that, that showcase all the different aspects of sustainability. <laughs> Another thing that was really important is that it was rooted in the culture and the environment. There was a local knowledge component that was really, really important. And regaining that knowledge was really important. And there's so much loss of local knowledge, so I want to encourage you as well to help preserve local knowledge. And uh, the last thing is that this was Oh, it's coming up. Thank you, Ron. I gave you the, uh, the the last thing that's important was that it, it involved the whole food system. You can leave it on that last one right for that. If you're interested in learning more about this, my colleagues at FAO um, and I started thinking about developing this five years ago, but it finally was published just last month. It's called um, There's a Practical Guidance Document for Using the Ten Elements that's now available online. I think it's called Harnessing the Power of the Ten Elements for Agroecological Transformation. And that is a guidebook, it's a handbook to help you use the ten elements to think about the multidimensional uh, sustainability of your system, like I shared about the story of my time. So thank you very much. <laughs>